Yep. Um, so our, our second speaker is uh, Nicole Warwick. Um, Nicole, can you please share your screen? Yes, I can do that. Just let me. Uh, so Sorry. Nicole will be speaking about uh, red emission from nature inspired bay annulated indigo derivatives. Um, so please, when you're ready, share your screen and you can begin your Which presentation. So that's, mm -hmm. that's perfect. We see that now. Yep. Just presentation. You can't see the other part. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, great. So we see the presentation. Yep. Great. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to um, thank Jos Bronson for the kind introduction there and also Professor Byrne as well for allowing me the opportunity to um, give this talk to you today. So, as Bronson mentioned, uh, today I will present my work on some red lasing and electroluminescence uh, from nature-inspired indigo derivatives. Okay. Um, so as part of my talk today, I'll go through, introduce you to the field of organic solid state lasers, as well as some of the criteria needed in order to achieve lasing, um, followed up by some of our our work on a, developing a new class of solution processable deep red lasing dyes, including their synthesis, photophysics, and laser behaviors, as well as electroluminescence using TADF assisted fluorescent OLEDs. So as you may be aware, lasers are a acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, and they are highly intense monochromatic um, light emitters with high directionality and large coherence length and just makes them great for applications such as optical sensing, um, virtual reality, and display and illumination, as well as data storage and communication. Of course, to realize these applications, we first need efficient lasing within the visual spectrum. And while inorganic lasers have been shown to have good blue light, efficient green and red emission have yet to be achieved. And we aim to solve this by the use of organic semiconductors, which, um, have good absorption and emission cross sections within the visual range. Among this, they can also be synthesized from low cost precursors, um, as well as be fabricated on a variety of different substrates, giving us a high flexibility within our current device design. And they can also be um, highly tunable in their physical and photophysical properties, um, which allows us to potentially reach um, emission within the entirety of the visual spectrum. So to get an organic solid state laser, uh, we basically have three parts. You have your pump source, which is electrically or optically pumped. You have your gain medium, which is your organic semiconductor in solid state. And you have your optical feedback structure, which is basically just a resonator made up of a two mirrors with one being semi-transparent to let your laser light through. And the emission we see from such a device is basically, um, is uh, dependent on the pumping strength that we apply to the device. So if we have low pumping strength, all that happens is we're exciting our gain medium. And when this happens, we have a molecule in excited state, which can radiatively decay to emit spontaneous emission, giving you your generic PL spectra that you would normally recognize. But if we start increasing the pumping, um, sorry, I have my laser light. Uh, if we start increasing this pumping strength, uh, what can occur is we start increasing the number of excited state molecules within our system. Um, and this, we can reach a state called population inversion. And this is basically when we have more, more molecules in the excited state than the ground state. And if some of our emitted photons start interacting with molecules in this excited state, um, they can stimulate the emission of an additional photon in the same phase and incident as the first. And these stimulated photons can uh, resonate back and forth, back and forth throughout the gain medium due to the resonator. And as this is happening, we're stimulating more and more photons to be emitted. And the other thing that's happening at the same time is that this emission is being is slowly becoming the same wavelength and phase, which causes generally narrowing in our emission um, before, the, before the gains overcome the losses in our system and we get our emissive laser light through as a, a very narrow 
emission PL. And the pumping threshold we need in order to achieve uh, lasing is called the lasing threshold. And experimentally, we find this by um, looking at the pump input compared to the pump output. Um, and that's where we get our lasing threshold once we reach a nonlinear regime. And of course, to reach lasing, it's all about overcoming the losses within your system. And some of these losses can include um, non radiative decay losses, such as uh, internal conversion or um, relaxation of your molecules. And you can also have uh, re reabsorption from uh, emission absorption overlap. And because we have so many molecules in the excited state in this system, you can have a higher rate of intersystem crossing occurring, uh, giving you triplet states. And this can result in triplet absorption and triplet-triplet annihilation, which are generally longer lived states and can cause the uh, lasing system to be unstable or even degrade. So keeping this all in mind, there generally is quite an ideal set of criteria we need in order to achieve lasing. And I've outlined some of these here. So as I mentioned, it's all about over increasing your gains and reducing your losses. And some of the ways to increase your gain are by having a high rate of decay rate and short excited state emission lifetime to um, generally decrease the rate of intersystem crossing. While also, and these will also affect um, your stimulated emission cross section. And as far as reducing losses go, you can just generally have low non radiative decay rates, uh, large stoke shifts to stop that self absorption, and of course, low, ultra low triplet absorption cross sections in the gain and PL region. And if we can achieve this, what we can have is a low lasing threshold as well as high photo uh, sorry, high stability within our lasing system. Of course, this is just under optical pumping. But ideally, uh, end game would be to integrate these devices into our optoelectronic circuitry. And for that, we would need electrical pumping. Um, and to do this, there are a few more things to consider, including high charge mobility and effic efficient electroluminescence, including brightness and um, EQE. So it's seeing as most of these materials would have to have all of these properties, it's not difficult to see why achieving electrically pumped uh, lasers is relatively difficult. But nevertheless, there have been some compounds that have been reported in literature that have these properties already. Um, and a, a majority of these are reported within the blue to high energy part of the emission spectrum with a, a emission thresholds of around 0.1 microjoules. However, we, if we move towards the lower energy part of the spectrum, um, achieving these low, a, low emission thresholds are more difficult to achieve. Um, for example, if you move on to green, for example of HPT carbazole with emission thresholds of around 2.4 microjoules and some of the lowest that have been reported. However, if we move on to the red emission, um, we can only, we only see emission thresholds of around 10 microjoules. And this is due to the uh, exponential increase of the non radiative decay rate as the energy gap decreases and especially through the formation um, and losses from vibronic coupling as extrapolated by energy gap law. And my general focus was in within this red emission range and of course um, developing a red emitting lasing material. And one great candidate for this is Sivalacra, which has great red emission uh, with solution PLQIs of around 76%. And it can be readily uh, derived from its non-emissive precursor indigo, which represents uh, quite a good low-cost starting material. Now, Sibylacra itself has a great rigid and planar core, uh, which gives us our red emission, but it's also great for reducing some non-radiated decay losses, um, as it could potentially reduce our vibronic coupling that we have as the energy gap decreases. It is also generally uh, said to be quite a stable material, um, which may improve its stability under our laser conditions. Of course, one issue both SIVA and indigo have in common is that they have very little solubility in common solvents, uh, making them impractical for study and generally difficult to synthesize and purify. So if we wanted to utilize um, SIVA lacra as a uh, lasing dye, we'd first need to make it solution processable. And that's where my focus, oops, that's where my focus comes in. 
So we did this by an attachment of some uh, solubilizing groups along this bay region of the material uh, in the form of a long linear dodecyl chain, as well as a uh, branched alkoxy chain with a two hexyl oxy. So moving on to synthesis um, for compound A, we started with a commercially available bromophenolacetic acid, which we protected um, in a esterification under microwave conditions uh, to give near quantitative yields before undergoing a alkyl aryl Suzuki coupling um, with an MBBN to attach our long alpha chain in good yields before deep protection and hydrolysis to get our common carboxylic acid. And then for compound B, uh, we attached the alkoxy unit by simple Williamson ether, starting from this 4-hydroxyphenylacetic acid to give the carboxylic acid in 67% yields. We then converted the carboxylic acids to acid chlorides, where we then uh, reacted them with indigo in a one-pot reaction to first substitute and then annulate to form this core in um, generally low yields. However, while they may be low, it's generally expected due to the complexity of this um, one pot reaction, as well as being reported in literature. And hence, if you do this stepwise, you can drastically improve the yields. Of course, uh, after having made these compounds, if you look at them in solution, they're generally quite similar, and this is reflected in their photophysics. So both compounds showed good red emission with PLQYs of around 96%. Um, which is great. However, when you move down to neat film, we see a drastic reduction in these PLQYs. And this is due to aggregate induced quenching, which we can generally place by the uh, broadening of this PL and as well as redshift um, in this spectrum. And we can, of course, increase the PL of the material in solid state just by blending in low concentration with a variety of hosts. So one of the first studies we did was um, the amplifier, to study the amplified spontaneous emission properties of Cibolacrot B in dope films under optical pumping by excitation with a nitrogen laser. And this ASC is just basically intrinsic glazing property of your materials and essentially a form of mirrorless lasing. Um, and in this case, we used some simple hosts of uh, NCP and CBP in a 5.8% blend which gave ASC thresholds of around 30 microjoules. But if we look at the PL and absorption spectrum here, um, what you can see is that we're losing a lot of energy as our PL of our hosts really don't overlap with the absorption of our emitter. Now we can fix this by the addition of another host, and that's what we did by adding um, a green emitting HPT, which overlaps quite nicely with our SIBA absorption. And this resulted in slightly lower ASC thresholds. More importantly, it also resulted in improved stability under above lasing threshold and below lasing threshold. And this is because we have good energy transfer between first MCP, then HPT, and then onto our fluorescent end emitter um, to emit our lasing. And we can optimize uh, this blend ratio to around 2 weight percent, which uh, causes a reduction in the ASC thresholds to around 9.6, which is similar to some of the state-of-the-art dyes reported, um, to give lasing around 650 nanometers, uh, which is generally good deep red emission. Uh, and this also affects the photostability of the material uh, by increasing it to basically no um, intensity, intensity reduction after around uh, 9,600 pulses. And if we compare this back to some of the state-of-the-art dyes that I mentioned earlier with similar ASC thresholds, we see that they generally see a, around a 70% reduction, um, while ours only show a 5%. Now, um, sorry, having shown good uh, ASC properties, we then moved on to the lasing properties of the dye. Um, and this we achieved by fabricating the gain medium on top of a distributed, first order distributed feedback grading. And the amplification in case of this DFB grading really depends on this Bragg condition. We're using optical constants and amplification wavelengths obtained in the ASC measurements. The grading period for the first order diffraction was chosen to be 200 nanometers. And 
once we fabricated on top of this DFB grading, we got ASC thresholds of around six microjoules, which is some of the lowest reported um, lasing thresholds uh, within the deep red lasing part of the emission spectrum, and it's this lasing emission here. We can, of course, further tune this emission just by varying the period as well as the thickness of the mediums um, as, uh, as quoted by the Bragg condition. But having shown these good lasing properties, uh, we then wanted to really know if the compound itself was uh, electroluminescent. And in some uh, preliminary devices, in one weight percent CVP, using a simple device structure of P.PSS as your hole transport and TBBI as your electron transport layer, um, it gave maxi QEs of around 4.3% uh, with um, max brightnesses of around 500 candela. You can of course see some, uh, oops, you can of course see some emission from CVP here, but rather than optimizing these devices, we thought to instead harness some non-emissive triplet excitons that were within the device. And you can do this by using TADF. Now, there are two ways that um, literature utilizes TADF to harness triplet excitons, and that is in third generation TADF OLEDs that you may all be familiar with, and in fourth generation TAF OLEDs. And in TAF OLEDs, they use TADF as an assistant dopant to upconvert 100% of the excitons formed within your host, um, which then transferred it to your TADF. And this 100% uh, of your excitons get transferred to the fluorescent end emitter via foster resonance energy transfer, um, or FRET, to emit 100% of the 100% IQE from your end emitter, generally increasing the maximum EQEs you can achieve to around 25%. This also results in generally higher color purity in comparison to your uh, regular TADFs as you have a narrow emission spectrum um, as TADFs are quite broad. So moving on with this idea, uh, we first had to choose the TADF assistant dopant. And in this case, we chose 4CZ IPN T-butyl as it showed very good possible energy transfer between our first host to assistant dopant and then emitter, and also good charge confinement within these devices. So once we worked out a blend ratio of around 20 to 1 weight percent um, TADF to emitter, uh, we got blend film PLQIs of around 82%. So using this in devices and using the same device structure as I showed previously, we got EQEs, improved EQEs of around 9.1% at 100 candelas, as well as max brightnesses of uh, 8,000 candelas with a good red emission. And while we do see some contribution from the TADF, this will be optimized in later devices. But if we take these results and compare them to literature, what we see is some of the highest EQEs reported um, in comparison to the solution processable TAF OLEDs that are currently reported. And in this case, there is only one, with the rest of these being thermally evaporated devices. So just to summarize, I showed some a new class of solution processable red lasing dyes with high PLQIs and low ASC and lasing thresholds, as well as high photo stability using a mixed host. And these have been reported in our recent advanced optical materials paper, um, if you'd like to know more. We also showed great uh, good preliminary electroluminescence, which generally shows that this Sivalacro is a very promising family of new laser dyes that I'm very happy to work with. And just to conclude, uh, I'd like to acknowledge, of course, my few supervisors, uh, Dr. McGregor and Associate Professor Namdustin Liu, as well as everyone at COPE, in particular Atul for his photophysics and lasing study, as well as Jan for fabricating the DFB grading. And of course, the folks at OPERA, um, in particular Associate Professor Mamada for helping fabricate the TAF OLEDs and Professor Adachi. And of course, our funding agencies, including the Australian Research Council and the Department of Industry and Innovation and Science, as well as the JSPS Quarter Core Exchange Program, which funded my research exchange to Kyushu University, where I helped, where I fabricated the TAF outlets that I showed you in this study. And of course, all of you for listening. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Nicole. That was uh, it's a comprehensive piece of work. Um, so it was very interesting to listen to that presentation. Um, I would like to call for some questions from the audience. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please just uh, remember you need to unmute your microphone. There's a, there's a question in the chat. Oops, I'm sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe oh, not. Well. <laughs> oh. now, now I can ask a question. So Nicole, um, I mean, it's really nice to see how you've taken all the synthesis, the, the photophysics and, and the devices. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I realize I've gone all dark, so I'm getting a bit lighter. Um, so you've, with your um, lazy, um, you made blends um, and then you were relying on energy transfer from the host to the emitter. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the efficiency of that process will also affect your lasing threshold. Um, did you yes. ever make it, um, um, have a look at, if you like, what the solution ASC threshold would be, or if you put it into a um, your compound into a, a sort of a, a matrix that you don't excite and you just only excite the um, your compound. Do you see a, a, a big change in the threat lazy or the AC threshold? I guess it would be in, in that case. Mm. Yeah, I unfortunately it doesn't exhibit lazing in solution itself, but I don't think we have the current lazing set up in order to excite just at our um, just at the absorption of our material. We only have the nitrogen laser, so we couldn't uh. really excite um, at the at the actual absorption but I would assume that you would see quite lower lasing thresholds because you don't have this loss of energy right as well yeah <clears throat> I mean do you know what the energy losses are in those particular processes I mean what proportion of excitons gets transferred um I'm not quite sure because it's under optical pumping there is some losses from triplet absorption that we can see and even though our PLQYs are quite high, so we have very low uh, potential triplet absorption in there, um, it's, yeah, it, maybe the losses are mostly due to triplet absorption in the system, but I'm not sure about the energy transfer. I think there maybe was a little bit of emission from here, but I think we optimized that with the mixed host, so I'm unsure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question as well, Attila, if that's okay. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. So hi, Nicole, it's a very nice talk. Um, I was wondering with the, what is the limit in your last four generation OLED to EQE 9%? I mean, it's very nice, but to go to electrical pumped lasers, I was wondering if this strategy, how it's going to work at very high exit and density is required for for lasing, because I guess your emitter sing singlet, you could still have some triplets on that stage at the very last stage, couldn't you? Or mm. so when so, when the threat to the emitter, mm -hmm. there is still a possibility for the emitter triplet to form, isn't it? Yeah. So that's so you you can have fret, which is um, from singlet to singlet or you can have a uh, dexter transfer and that's to your triplet. So that can be, um, I have an extra slide for this. <laughs> uh, that can be, so generally that's about your uh, fret and dexter possibilities. And within TADF and fluorescent emitters, your dexter radius is relatively lower. So you can decrease the amount of this triplet transfer, so to speak. Um, if you just increase the distance between your TADF and your uh, fluorescent emitter. So if you introduce, for example, like bulky groups, you can just stop dextra transfer from happening. And then this no longer seems to be an issue. Does that answer your question? Even, even at the sort of uh, electrical pumped um, exit and densities. So 
I wonder uh, how very high densities would look like, but... Um, I'm, I'm unsure whether this specific TAF OLED would really be able to work with glazing, as you generally need quite low emitting um, emission lifetimes. So, mm -hmm. and because like TDFs generally have quite high emission lifetimes, it's really be utilized for laser, electrically pump lasing, but it's a good uh, indicator of whether this energy transfer could work. But I'm, I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, if there's no other questions, no one else wants to jump in, um, then thank you very much. Bronson, sorry. Oh, oh, of course. Prashant, please sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to yeah uh, ask a few questions. Yeah, it was, uh, first of all, yeah, nice presentation, uh, Nicole. I just have a couple of questions. First, uh, like uh, when you designed this die, and I noticed that you made the two alkyl substituted uh, derivative. Uh, is there a difference between the, I mean, effect of alkyl substitution on, on your overall performance, either in a uh, as a as a you know lesser devices or might be in your TDF type of devices. What is your impression about uh, effect of alkyl chain on on overall performance? Well, in in this specific one, we we kind of tested between yeah these two alkyl chains. We had the long linear chain and the alkoxy group, and the alkoxy group slightly shifts the emission um, into like slightly redshifts the emission, and that's just due to the electronegativity of, electronegativity of the... Um, Alkoxys uh, are uh, electron yeah. donating rich compared to the... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but that causes like a redshift in the emission for B. But we also generally saw um, slightly shorter lifetimes, but that might just be because you have potentially less aggregation or even... Um, less interaction between the molecules. Um, yeah, I mean, in, yeah, usually the alkyl ones are uh, kind of uh, propensate to kind of aggregate easily, but once we have a alkoxy, they might be more soluble. And as, a, as I mean, you might have some branch alkyl one that may further inhibit your uh, aggregation and you may get a better performance. Because I think upon aggregation, the efficiency then can come down. Yeah, also. so and in terms of lasing in itself, um, I don't have them here, but the lasing thresholds for A in the similar optimized weight blend were around 10.5 microjoules, which I would say is pretty similar, but that might just be due to the overlap of our host in the specific host we used. It might've overlapped with Subalacra B better than A, and that might've caused slightly lower lasing thresholds. But yeah, we also see like slightly lower lifetimes. times. So yeah. it's kind of like I, similar, but... Yeah. I also miss your energy levels of this new dye. Have you measured homolumos? Um, I did. Oh, do I have them? I I do have them. Um, I just haven't written them here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah uh, they are in the paper if you would like to know more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, I think in the interest of time, um, thank you very much, uh, Nicole. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, very much enjoyed uh, you running through that. So yes, um, I'm sure that everyone in the audience would join me in, in thanking you very much for that. Um, so uh, what I will do is, uh, is turn off the recording and um, then we're done.